we're now picking up where we left off before spring break, before the, the, the midterm of, of you know, burning out the actual system further. So again, the overview of where we're at in the semester is that uh, we talked about the networking layer and then we're starting from the bottom and sort of going up, although we've already covered the storage manager. So now, right now we're at this part here where the query plans are going to show up through the networking layer. We'll talk about how to actually, or SQL shows up through the networking layer. We'll talk about how the, 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 the optimizer and the planner is going to generate a query plan. And now we're talking about, if we, assuming we already have a query plan, now we need to start executing the operators in that query plan to produce results for our query. So we're at this point here, but then now we're still going to go up the stack and talk about how we can then compile plans into sort of efficient uh, machine code to execute them quick or very efficiently. And that's sort of what the team was talking about uh, with the DSL stuff um, from, from last, last time. And then we'll go up even further again and talk about how we actually generate a, an efficient query plan uh, in our optimizer. So again, we're here, we're going up, okay? So the, the next couple of lectures are really going to be focusing on uh, operator execution. How can we take a, again, some, some component or operator in our query plan and execute them efficiently? And this is now going to be going way deeper than we've ever really covered in, in the introduction class. Right, because now we're going to actually start really caring about what's the hardware we're going to do, where's, where's the, the data we want to operate in memory, what's in our CPU caches, what are some additional instructions that the CPU will provide us that can now also do things in parallel or more, more efficiently. So basically, we're going to have a, a big uh, bag of tricks we can do to run these queries super fast. Right? Um, query plan processing, what we're talking about today, is basically how we're going to organize the overall system to have it execute the operators in the query plan. But we're not going to talk about what, what actually those operators are just yet. That's when we start getting into like uh, inlining application logic for user-defined functions. That'll be next Monday. Uh, the parallel join algorithms, vectorized operations, or vectorized operators using SIMD, and then query compilation. So again, all of these together are the things we're going to use to execute operators. The high-level thing we're talking about today is how we organize the system to execute these operators. Right? And where do they send their data? And then everything else will then be, all right, now within a single operator, what is some crazy shit you can do to make that run really, really fast? Right? And, and some of these things you know, uh, are easier to do because we're in memory. Right? We're, not, we're not worrying about disk. So the, again, the goal of what we're talking about today and going forward is we have some query plan that the optimizer generated from SQL. From SQL. It doesn't have to be SQL, but in our world it is. Uh, and then inside of this query plan, we're going to have operators. Right? We'll make a distinction between physical operators and logical operators later on. But for our purposes, we have a physical operator that says, I want to do, I want to do X on some data that I'm getting from either a table, an index, a child operator. It doesn't matter. Then it's going to, then, you know, it's going to crunch into that and produce some output. And then we'll say an instance of that operator, since we, we want to be able to run this in parallel, we'll call this an operator instance. So one core could have... Uh, you know, could take one operator and deploy it on multiple cores and all of them are running in, in parallel. And each of those would be an instance. And then a task or a pipeline would be uh, a sequence of one or more of these operator instances running within a single, uh, within a single, a, a single core. So our purpose is here, we're, we're, we're focusing on at a high level, how are we taking these guys, the tasks or the pipelines, and having them run on different cores. And where are they getting the data from? And where do they send their data to? That's sort of the goal of, of today. But we need to understand why we want to organize things a certain way. OK? Right, so as I sort of already said, if you get rid of the disk, which is sort of the whole point of this, this semester, if we get rid of the disk, everything fits in main memory, then the goal for how we're going to speed up queries isn't as obvious as it was before. Right? In a disk-based system, the disk is always the slowest thing. Network, is also, network also sucks too, but you know, sometimes you can't avoid that. But the disk sucks, it's slow. So we want to do things like heavyweight compression to, to minimize the amount of I.O. we're doing, or minimize the time it takes to get data into memory. But now, disk is gone. We still need it for logging, right? and that's unavoidable. Uh, but now, there's, the, the thing we want to target to speed up our system, it's not as obvious as it was before. So it's sort of going to be the orchestration of a bunch of different ideas together to, to speed things up. Now, query compilation is going to be a huge win. 
Uh, vectorization also matters. Parallelization also, also, also matters. So, there's no, so what I'm trying to say, there's not one thing I can point to you say, if you're building a new data system from scratch, do this. Do this one thing first. Right? We are actually trying to do all of them. Because right? in some ways, if you're building a modern system, you want all of them. But there's no one of these that are, are going to stand out uh, clearly better than others. Okay? So what are our goals now? If we assume everything's in, in memory, the disk is no longer the bottleneck, what kind of things do we need to start caring about? Well, it's the low-level parts of, of what the actual CPU is going to do. So there's three different optimization goals we could have in trying to speed things up. The first is that we can reduce the instruction count of the, ex the execution of the query. So that means essentially we're, we want to do less things, we want to execute less instructions, but still produce the same amount of work, the same amount of results. Right? And this is not something like, you know, the compiler can help us in some ways, but many times it's also going to be us specializing our code or organizing in such a way that we reduce the amount of work we have to do in, or, in order to execute a query, or execute one of these operators. The next is going to be to reduce the number of cycles we have per instruction. So again, the high level basic idea is here, we're going to have some number of instructions, but instead of having, taking longer to execute those instructions, assuming that they're fixed, Right? We've already done the, maybe the first one, try to reduce the number of instructions. For now, with the instructions that we have, we want to reduce the time it takes to execute them. And the metric we're going to use is to reduce the number of cycles we have per instruction. Right? And so what does this mean? What's the main bottleneck that would cause an instruction to take multiple cycles? Yes? Memory stores and loads. Or cache missions is another way to think about this. Right? So this is us now trying to figure out to, I guess as already says there, right? <laughs> But it's, it's still a good answer. Um, the, this is us about, this is us trying to, to maximize the locality of data that we have in our caches and, and re reuse it as much as possible. And we'll see when we talk about the processing models, like the volcano processing model or the iterator processing model, these techniques are written in such a way that they're actually bad for locality. Because maybe you go operate on one tuple and then rather than riding along that tuple and doing as many things as possible with it, you go back and look at the next tuple, right? And the last one will be to obviously parallelize execution, right? We don't need to say this. Moore's law is ending, so we're not going to have you know way faster clock speeds. The the we're sort of hitting the physical limit how small the the the, the, the die size can actually be, or the transistor size can be. So we're not going to get you know a huge performance just because the, the CPU got better, right? Or for for a single core. Instead, uh, Intel is going to give us a bunch of cores. We need to make sure that now we implement operators, we can execute these in, in parallel, efficiently. So let's talk a little, bit, a little bit about today, how we organize the overall query plan when we execute it to parallelize operations. Uh, but then when we talk about, in, in, the, in the next couple of weeks, we can take like a single join algorithm and how we run that efficiently in parallel. Okay? All right, so today our, our agenda is sort of three parts. Um, we're going to begin with the, uh, the vector-wise paper, the, the Monaby X100 paper uh, that you guys read, and talk about their analysis on, of, of what modern CPUs look like and why running, uh, you know, why existing implementations of database systems at the time, in the, in the mid-2000s, why they were inefficient for the architecture that still looks a lot, not exactly the same as they described in the paper, but some parts of it still, still are the same. Then from this, we then talk about uh, again, the processing models of how we actually want to take a query plan, break up its operators into uh, tasks or pipelines, and then have them be scheduled with, within our system using all the scheduling stuff we talked about uh, before the break. And then we'll finish up talking about, at a high level, what different variants of parallel execution look like. And again, think high level for the, for the, for the entire query plan. And then we'll talk about, in, in the subsequent lectures, how we can execute each operator in parallel. Okay. All right, so the, the paper I had you guys read, as I said, it was, it's from 2005, so it's, it's almost 15 years old. Um, but to me, I actually, I actually love this paper. One, because it's super easy to read, uh, and you know, the stuff at the end with, with the, the, when they describe their system, maybe not so much, um, but that, that beginning part, they really lay out, like, here's the problems you have with in-memory databases running on modern hardware, and here's why everyone's gonna get crappy performance for, for analytic queries. So I'll say also too, like we're focusing on analytical queries here because this is where we're le reading large amounts of data. For the uh, for OLTP stuff, there are things you want to do to get better performance and target it towards the hardware that you have. 
but the 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 bang for the buck you're going to get is not going to be at the same scale as you get for analytical queries because these things are just reading way more data. There's a bunch of other overhead that like you can avoid like lock contention at, the, at a logical level that will slow down performance of a system. Uh, whereas these guys don't have to sort of deal with these things because again, it's just reading data as fast as possible and processing them. So the first half of this paper provides a a really good low level analysis of the the performance issues in in memory databases, or actually for actually just for all databases because they, look, they looked at MySQL as well and Oracle. Um, but I looked at how they you know these guys were not designed for the modern uh, sort of CPU landscape as it existed at the time. Um, and the way to sort of to reason about it is the the systems they looked at were written in a way that was sort of natural for humans to write. It was written in a way from an engineering standpoint that was easy for the, the programmer to reason, reason about. But the way that actually is best for humans actually turns out to be the worst thing for the CPU itself, uh, to, run, to you know, get efficient execution on the CPU. So then, based on these findings, they then proposed a new system. At the time, it was called MoneyD MoneyDB X100, because Peter Bontz and Marcin came out of the, the, the MoneyDB project at CWI. But then they forked this off, and that then later became VectorWise. Um, Vectorwise is actually really good. We benchmark it today. I think you've done this, right? Or no, you did. We benchmarked in other experiments Vectorwise against uh, some other systems we've talked about so far. And again, like the old, the last public version of this from like 2015, 2014-ish, still beats modern systems. Um, it was it was really good. So then, Vectorwise got bought by Actian. Actian is a I don't want to say holding company, but it's like a they buy old databases. So they bought Ingress, they bought uh, some other stuff, but they bought Vectorwise. Um, and then they killed it. Well, they, re they renamed it to Vector. Then they killed it. Right? Like, if, like, if you didn't know what you were looking for when you went to the Actium website, you wouldn't find it. And so every year I would say, yeah, Vectorwise is really good, but like, too bad Actium killed it off. Right? Or they changed the name and, and they made it a version for Hadoop or some like that. Right? And so I kept saying in all of my videos, like, I love Vectorwise, too bad they killed it. Got to the point where actually somebody acting saw it and they emailed me and they're like, hey, just so you know, Vector is no longer in hiding. It's now back on the Actium website. Because again, if you went to the Actium website, it wouldn't be available for download. But you had to know where the old link was to find it using like archive.org. Anyway, he just tells me that like, this is all changed. Vectorwise is back from the dead. So that was kind of nice. But then they actually had an announcement, uh, what is this, three or four days ago. Um, Actium has now been rebranded re re as Actium Avalanche. Uh, and now they're selling it as a uh, like a, a, a data data warehouse in the cloud, right? Sort of like Redshift or Snowflake or something like that, right? Um, I can't comment on how you know how good this is, but I will say again for the single node version, uh, the Vectorwise is actually really good. And if I remember correctly, Vectorwise is actually based on MMAP. Now, much as I complain about MMAP, again for read-only workloads, MMAP is okay. So they weren't doing transactions; um, they just load the entire database into memory. Um, so the other, again, other backgrounds. So Peter Bontz and Marcin Zorkowski were the two people working on Vectorwise. Uh, Peter went back to CWI and he's building a new system there after he left Actian. Uh, Marcin went off to go found Snowflake. So a lot of the techniques that, that, that or the things we'll talk about from the Vectorwise paper and things we'll talk about going forward the rest of the semester, these are the kind of things that they, they went off and built in Snowflake. That's part of the reason why Snowflake's really good. Um, so it's sort of like, you know, I guess the database community is very incestuous. Um, Okay, so there's some parts of this paper, as I said, that are, that are a bit dated. Uh, like they talk about itaniums, and I, I, I fancy that some of you actually have never heard of an itanium before. Who has, who's ever heard of itanium? Raise your hands, okay. Oh, everyone, all right, perfect, all right, perfect. Well, nobody uses it anymore. HP killed them off, right? Intel killed them off. Um, but like they talk about some things like the, the pipeline for the Pentium 4 chip they were looking at had like 31 stages. Whereas like a modern Hoswell, Broadwell since like 2015 or so is now we're down to like 14 stages. So we don't really have that, that super long pipeline anymore, but there are still, the problems you still have with, with the pipeline still are in effect and still matter to us in, in our database system. So again, the harbor is slightly different, but the, the main ideas uh, st still matter to us. All right, so we need to understand what our CPU is gonna look like in order to understand how we can design the system to, uh, the, to, to, to operate efficiently on it. So this is like everything you need to know about CPUs for databases 101, right, in like two slides. 
So again, the CPU is being organized in these pipeline stages, and the idea of these, of these pipelines is that uh, because a, a single instruction may take multiple clock cycles, like for example, if I had to go you know, do a load into memory, it's going to take a couple cycles for that to end up in my, in my CPU caches. So the idea here is that they can have the CPU operate on multiple instructions at the same time uh, because they can have different parts of the CPU you know, executing something different at every single instruction. And then underneath the covers, again, like you don't write your program assuming that they're going to do all these weird out of order stuff. You know, you know, the compiler just generates the instructions and the CPU then figures out how to then sort of shuffle things around while it's running to have the thing, the CPU always crunching, uh, crunching instructions at all times, right? So these are also called, so, you know, so modern CPUs have these pipelines, but then uh, if you have a single pipeline, if you have multiple pipelines, it's called super scalar. Um, and the basic idea here is just like you do, and you have multiple pipelines that are all sort of executing parallel, um, and then keep sort of firing off these instructions if you know that they're going to be independent of each other. Right? But as soon as you have like things like dependencies or branch mispredictions, we'll talk about the next slide, then you sort of have to, the CPU has to correct itself to make sure that it actually does what does things in, in the proper order. Because right? you don't want to have out of order execution of things, because that would that would break up above, you know, up above the, the the correctness of your application, for example. All right? So we won't talk about Flynn's taxonomy so much. This will make more sense when we talk about parallel execution or SIMD. Um, but Flynn's taxonomy is a way to describe different computer systems. Uh, so you can have like a, a parallel system could be classified as, as you know, what the instruction stream is or what the data stream is. So a single pipeline for this in, in our world is a single instruction stream, single data stream. So we have one instruction stream coming on, one data stream that they're operating on, and then, but then we can sort of do that in parallel in, in our different pipelines. <coughs> so what do we care about for, for superscalar CPUs? What do we care about in CPU or in database systems? What well, at a high level, again, this is sort of what every application would care about, but this matters a lot in our world. Um, and because since we're, we're the ones actually building the database system, we can architect it sort of in a way to try to avoid some of these, uh, uh, these problems. So the first is that we have to deal with dependencies. And this is where if you have one instruction depends on another instruction, then you can't have them be in the same pipeline and sort of execute them immediately after the other. Because you need the output of the first one before you can get the second one. And then you need to put the output somewhere and then provide it to the second one. Right? So we have to avoid, actually, this is hard to do. You can't really avoid these dependencies. But the, the CPU is not going to be able to get you know, full speed execution of your instructions if you have dependencies. The one that we can program around uh, better is to do uh, handle branches. So because to fill the pipeline is expensive, uh, and you know, so, so again, we have a 14 stage pipeline, so we have 14 instructions, and so I'm executing some instruction here, and then the output of that instruction, say like it's an if branch, that then determines what code path I go down. So for my remaining instructions in the pipeline, I can't, I, you know, I don't actually know what path I'm going to go down, so I can't fill in the instructions that are going to execute next. So modern CPUs will try to predict what path you're going to go down, and then fill in your pipeline the instructions that you would execute if you went down a particular branch. And again, how they actually figure this out is like, you know, trade secret, but you can think of something like keeping really track of like, I've been down this path before, what's the, what probability will I go down, you know, I, I've seen this if branch before, what probability will I go down one branch versus the other? At a high level, that's, that's essentially what they're doing, but it's, way, it's, it's more complicated than that. Um, and so what will happen is if the branch prediction gets, gets, gets it wrong, right, so I, then I, I have to basically flush my pipeline, throw away any maybe speculative work I've executed, assuming I was going to go down a particular branch, I throw all that away, then load in the branch I should have gone down into my pipeline, and then start executing that. So again, this is problematic because again, it's 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 something that the hardware is doing. We don't have complete control over to say, hey, hey, go down this. I'm I'm probably gonna go down this branch, so maybe prefetch this one versus the other one. We can't we can't do that. Uh, that's all underneath the covers to us. So what's the where does where's the most obvious thing in a database system where this thing becomes problematic? Well, what's the most common thing we're gonna execute in our in our database system where we would have branches? Where calls filters exactly yes, right? So 
Think about think about this. I, I, what is a, what is a where clause? I'm scanning the table. I have some like where something greater than something or something less than something. So I'm taking a value that's that's that comes from the tuple itself, right? It's come comes from the table, and I'm comparing it against another constant. So for every single tuple I'm looking at, that value from the tuple is going to change. And again, unless I do some like crazy pre-sorting. Uh, then it's it's unlikely that the the branch the branch predictor is going to ever get going to get this correct, right? Because it's going to be completely random. So it's going to you know it's you know fifty percent of the time it's going to choose the wrong path and we're going to get bad performance, All right? So let's look at this in more detail and see how we actually can design a scan operator with a where clause to avoid branches. Right? And this is something again where we can design our database systems internals in such a way. To be aware of what the harbor is actually doing, and potentially, you know, have a uh, get better performance because of that. All right. So, say we wanted to run a simple query like this: select star from table where key greater than some low value and key less than less than greater less than equal to them some high value. So, if you were like building a database from the first time, you would implement it sort of like this. Right. This this is the branching implementation. Right. Again, I, I apologize for showing code. In some of these lectures, you just sort of have to. But normally, I tell my students don't show code because nobody ever reads it. But this is simple enough that you should be able to follow it, All right? For every single tuple in my table, I go uh, I go grab the key I want to compare in my in my tuple. Then I'm going to do my if branch if key greater than or equal to low value and key less than <coughs> less than or equal to the high value. Then I'm going to copy it into my output buffer, and say the output buffer is just a giant array. And then so I increment the offset that I'm writing to my buffer. Uh, every time I add something, right? So again, the the what's going to suck here from 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 a CPU standpoint is this bad boy right here because we're not going to be able to predict this, right? Or like it's going to depend on the data and there's there's it's just going to be a completely random dis distribution. So to implement this without any branches, you would do this. So for every single tuple, immediately copy it to my output buffer. I don't check; I just copy it. Right? Then, when I want to do my comparison of the key to whether I see whether I, I should include it, I'm just doing a I'm doing arithmetic operators here to tell me whether uh, the if this is less than this, then I, I, I have a one, and this is sorry, if this is greater than or equal to this, I, I have a one, and then key is less than or equal to that, then I have a one. I add these two values together, and that's either going to give me zero or one. It's zero if only one or neither of these matched. It's one if only if w both of them matched. Then I get that that's just my off. That's sorry. The value of this, either one or zero, is what I'm going to add to my offset in my output array. So if I don't match, this goes to zero. I come back around and I just overwrite the last tuple I put in there. Of course, now I'm, I'm missing an extra piece here. We have to check to see what was was the last thing I add, was the last thing I just added should be there or not. If yes. Keep it. If no, then then truncate the last one. Right? There's there's an extra step you have to do afterwards. But in this case here, I'm 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 assuming I'm going to match. I always copy it in and then I check later. Yes. Does the Turner operator there not count as branching? His question is: Did the Turner operator not count as branching? So th that's this thing here, the, the question mark. Uh, no, because you can rewrite this as as, as math, as arithmetic, and then it's it's single instruction to do the comparison. Oh, the compiler just does that for you. Yeah. Okay. Yes. You'd also have to like be careful to use logical and and not short circuiting and, right? The statement is you have to be careful to use logical and and not short circuiting and. Um, yeah. So well, wow. Well, because wouldn't that implicitly create a branch? Yeah, but like yeah. So so in this case here, if match. Actually, because it's not an if clause, because it's it, it turns into arithmetic instructions, it it always executes both of them. As far as I know, yeah. Right? Don't install Windows. Sorry. All right. So again, the key thing is here, because here it's an if clause. It's gonna, you know, say you do the stupidest thing. You say, all right, well, the last time I went through this branch, I went. Last time I had this if clause, I jumped into this branch here. So let me go pre-execute pre that or re fetch that in, because that, that's what I th that's what I think is gonna happen. But again, if it's if it's Every if every other one matches, and every you know every odd one matches, every E one doesn't match. Then that's the worst case scenario because I'm going to blow out my my you know 
I'm sort of I'm mispredicting all the time. In this case here, I'm paying. Extra, I'm doing extra work because I'm copying things that I don't actually need, but I don't have any branch misprediction. So I'm just like blasting through my pipeline as, as fast as the clock speed of the CPU, right? So this obviously depends on what the data looks like. So this is from another paper later on from the Vectorwise guys, where they're doing a sequential scan, and they basically have the same branching versus non-branching, branching versus branchless uh, selection operator I just showed in the last slide. And they're varying along the, the, the x-axis, the selectivity of the where clause. So this is where you would have 0% of tuples match, and this is when, when you have 100% of tuples match. So the red line is the no branching one, and as expected, you're do, no matter what the, the distribution of the data looks like, or the selectivity of your where clause, you're always doing the same amount of work, and that's why it's basically a horizontal line. But the arc you see for the blue line, that's the branching case. Right? So when everything, is, when everything is sort of less than roughly around 5% here, so when you have less than 5% selectivity, the CPU's prefetching or, or branch predictor gets it pretty, you know, is, is, is correct most of the time. And therefore, it's the, the benefit you get from, from predicting that your thing is not going to match and not having to do branch prediction is, is outweighs that, you know, the overhead of, of, of the extra work you're doing in the, branch, the branchless case. But when you're up here, and obviously when you're at 50%, right, that's the peak, because you're roughly 50, you're wrong 50% of the time, uh, and that sucks for the CPU. So again, this is a really good example. We'll see this later on. This actually, the branchless code actually has some other benefits when we start doing SIMD and vectorized instructions, because SIMD doesn't have if clauses, uh, where a branchless approach seems like it'd be wasteful because you're doing useless work, but that actually turns out to be the better approach. Okay. All right, so for the other optimization we can, we can have by is you know, reducing our uh, instruction count, um, the, 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 the way to sort of think about this is that in the examples that they showed, I think for my SQL in the paper, was that the where clauses are super expensive because of the, the system is ri being written in such a way to be general purpose and be able to handle all of these different data types within the same code path of doing the various operators in the system. So the way to think about that is like, I'm gonna, say I want to do an addition, I'm going to have this giant switch operator that says, if my left operand is this data type and my right operand is this data type, here's the, here's the addition instruction that I want to do. And again, they talk a little bit about how Vectorize handles it. They do it by pre-compiling those comparisons and just figuring out on the fly as you run which comparison function you, you know, that you've pre-compiled you want to run. That's one way to do query compilation. We'll see the... The, the DSL or LLVM stuff later on on the fly, but that's that's one example of how to actually avoid this problem, right? So again, these giant switch statements sucks, sucks because that's just more if instructions, and now that means more branch misprediction in the CPU, right? And somebody's also the function calls now to jumps into memory, and that's that's setting up your stack and do those calls as well. So we already saw why this is problematic before when we talked about the numeric data type, when I showed you this sample code from from Postgres. Right, so this, but so here's our switch statement, and then you see here's all these different instructions to basically do you know something equals something or something you know is greater than something. Right, in, in this case here we're doing fixed fixed uh, fixed width or fixed decimal um, arithmetic, but in a lot of cases for other parts of the system, in the MySQL example they talked about, you're going to see these giant switch statements to handle you know co co comparisons between different data types as well because you have to cast things. All right, so. The goal for uh, reducing the instructions we have to execute will be by kind of specializing this code to only support the, to have a function only support the data type that we actually know about ahead of time. So we're not going to talk about how to do this just yet. This will come up when we talk about compilation mostly. But again, th but this is something in the back of our mind we should be thinking about how to specialize the system to get better performance because that's going to actually be the best thing for the CPU as well. Okay. So now we want to talk about in the processing model, which I'll define as the high-level approach of how the system is going to execute a query plan. And for these different processing models, they're going to have different trade-offs for different types of workloads. So we're actually going to talk a little bit about OTP versus OLAP here, whereas the, I mean, everything I've said matters in both worlds. Uh, you know, re reducing instruction count, that's clearly always going to be a good idea. Um, as I said, but for, that we're, we're mostly being t describing the context of OLAP environments. For this point here, we'll actually talk about uh, both workloads. So the first approach is called the iterator model, 
also sometimes, sometimes called the volcano model or the pipeline model. Volcano is, it was an influential system at a late 1980s, early 1990s out of, I think he was in Oregon. Um, but this guy, he, he, Volcano was a, um, was a sort of optimization framework. We're also going to talk about Cascades, which is the, the, the successor of Volcano. Um, but this is from the same guy who wrote the, the locking paper you guys read about from B-Tree Indexes, Gertz Graphy. So he's bun, done a bunch of stuff. So the textbook definition or the, 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 the sort of more, more formal name of what we're describing here is the iterator model. But people often refer, refer to it as the Volcano model because this, this paper sort of laid out how to do this in parallel first. So the idea here of the iterator model is that every query plan operator is going to have this next function. And what will happen is the, a child or a parent node will call next to its one of its child nodes to have it go send up to it or retrieve a, the next tuple that it's supposed to process. So for every single next function invocation, you get back one tuple, right? And the idea is here is that the, the, the parent node is basically going to loop over this, this next function and keeps calling next, next, next on his, on his child, gets back some tuple and maybe does some, some intermediate process before sending it to its parent. Um, and it keeps do doing this, calling next on his child until the child comes back and says, I don't have any more. Right? And at that point, we, we know we've, we've processed all the data we need to process at that side of the tree in our query plan. So let's look at an example here. So say we're doing a simple join on A and B, where A.ID equals B.ID B value. And then we have a simple predicate on, on B value, right? And then we have a uh, projection at, at, at the top. So the way to think about this, and again, I apologize for showing code, but we have to do this, is that we have these, uh, for each of these different operators in a query plan, these correspond to a little, little, you know, a little function, a little snippet of code. And then we're going to start at the top, right? And we're going to have this for loop over uh, for every tuple in child.next. And then every time we call child.next, that invokes this function here. Like to say down here below, like for, for its child, give me the, uh, you know, give me the next tuple that you have. All right, so this one here, we're doing a loop over child.next. We call next down here, we get down here. And this guy's going to uh, loop over the left child because it's doing a join. So it calls left.next, and that lands us down here. Now this is our access method, our scan operator, where we're actually just doing a sequential scan over A. And we see we have this emit function. So this is going to look at every single tuple in A. And then for every tuple that it gets, it calls emit, which then sends back a single tuple up to this guy. So for every time we call emit, the, the execution stops here. We still maintain state, almost like, a, um, like a, an iterator in Python, where we know that if we come back and book this thing again, we don't start from the beginning. We pick up where we left off. But then we send this call as emit, and the execution context of our thread that's running this, this, this query plan goes back up to, to the parent. And the parent just keeps doing this, doing this, and, and getting back single tuples uh, until the, the child here says, I have enough. But inside our for loop, for every single tuple we get, we're going to put it into our hash table, because assuming we're here, we're, we're doing a hash join. So then when I'm done, when, when the, my left child gives me everything that it wants to give, then I call next on my, on my right child goes down, it calls next in this, in this filter operator from this guy here, and then again, single tuple goes back all, all the way up, all right? And then we do our join, and then, and then we, we made a tuple going up. So we'll talk about pipelines, we talk about query compilation a bit more, but one way to think about this is like, uh, the, the left side and this thing here is a pipeline, because this could run in, uh, I could, for every tuple I get, I could then put on my hash table, um, but the pipeline ends after two because I can't actually get the output for my projection until I build my hash table and then I start probing it here. So like this, the top one can't proceed until uh, the bottom children have, have, or at least this side here, the left side of here has, has produced all its results. So again, this is called pipelining and then there's a pipeline breaker that says when you can't keep going and you have to go back and get the next job. So this iterator model is used in almost every single data system that you, that you know about that you've ever heard of. Uh, I'm showing a small sampling here. These are the ones that actually can, can, can confirm from either looking at the source code or you know, looking at the documentation that, that, that I know they're doing the iterator model. Um, again, any transactional system, any OTP system will be doing this because this, this well, some, with one or two exceptions, so I'll show next slide, but like, this is just the way everyone implements it because it's the easiest one to, to write because you have these nice functions, abstraction, you call next and get data going up, right? So 
One nice thing about this is that output control is super easy to implement this, like a limit clause, because you just stop calling next when you get all the data you want. Right? You don't have to have any additional logic to have some children uh, stop emitting results because they're going to send up all everything you need, and it's almost like an on-demand request. Give me, give me the next tuple. So I've, if I have everything I need based on my limit clause, then I can just stop. All right. And then the pipeline breakers are these guys here. Join some queries and order wise. This is where you can't continue up the query plan with a tuple until you get all the results from, from one of your children. All right. So again, this is really good for OTP because, well, it's not great for OTP, but it's, this is the most general purpose one. This is what sort of like, you can do this for analytics, you can do this for OTP. It's not particularly good at either one. It's just, again, it's a general purpose thing. The next approach is called the materialization model. And the idea is that instead of when you call next, instead of getting back a single tuple, uh, you get back all the tuples from your children. So it's one function call down below and it spits back everything that, that it would ever, everything that it's ever going to generate all at once. All right? So the reason why this is, this is good for, for uh, old TP systems is because these things don't produce a lot of tuples. So rather than worrying about this function call as you go down, uh, we'll see this in a second, you actually push the data going up and then you don't call next, 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 next. You don't have to set up these you know, stacks of calling these functions. It's just one invocation within a single operator to send everything that you actually want. But here's a good example where like, because it's a bottom-up approach versus potentially versus a, a top-down approach, you do have to pass down hints to avoid scanning more data than you actually need. Like if up above I know I have a limit clause where I only care about one tuple, then down below, I need to make sure it knows that I only need one tuple because otherwise it's going to dump all the tuples up and then I throw them all away until I get the very top. So, the, you know, as I'm describing it, we're, we're describing these as, as tuples and it sort of implies that it's a, a, a row store where you're getting all the attributes for a single tuple, but it doesn't have to be that way. It could just be a, like a column store approach where it's all the, tu all the tuples for a single column for all, all the, the attributes within a column for all the tuples. And you just pass back that column instead of having to materialize the whole thing. So here's, here's roughly how, what it looks like. If this works anymore. Nope. Awesome. Sorry. Is it frozen? God damn it. That's weird. Um, all right, whatever, sorry, it froze. All right, so instead of having next, we have an output function. So at the very top, uh, my, we're starting from the top going down. I call output, and this says, give me all the tuples that my child has. So I go down here, and, so, and this has output. So it goes to the left side, give me all the tuples that you have. So down here, we create a buffer. We iterate over every single tuple in A, that's the table we're scanning. We add it to our buffer, buffer and then we re return it. We just send that data back up, and again, it's all the tuples that this operator down here is ever going to touch or ever, ever, ever look at. So this point here, when we call return, we never go back to this guy because it materializes all the data that it's actually going to need. Same thing, we come down the other side, it gets its ch child output, it gets down here, materialize the, tuple, materialize the, the total tuple, and then send that back up, and we go all the way up there. All right? So again, I'm showing you this as a top-down approach. It could also be bottom up. I could just take this thing, execute this first, produce a bunch of tuples, put it in, you know, all the tuples I'm ever going to generate, put it in some buffer, and then have this guy then read from that buffer. Right? But in this case here, I'm going top down because it looks like it looks like the other one. So this, I think, in my opinion, the bottom up approach with materialization uh, model is the right way to do the OTP because it's fewer function calls, it's fewer coordination between these different operators. We don't care about parallel execution in OTP for a single query, or don't, which is called intro query parallelism, because there's, you know, if I'm going to go read one tuple, I can't really parallelize that, right? So this is this bottom-up materialization model is the best approach, I think, the most lightweight approach for uh, uh, for OTP. For OLAP, I think it's a bad idea, um, and this is actually what MoonDB did, and this is what the the vectorwise guys said. No, this is wrong. This is the right way to do this, which is the they're in the vectorized model. But Monet did this, at least the old version of high rise did this, which was an HTAP system. Um, 
with roots from, from uh, in some ways, uh, from the MoonDB project. But these guys do this. Now, they were a column store, so they were materializing the entire column and sending it up. But again, if I have a billion tuples, my select operator uh, filters out maybe half of them, so I have half a billion tuples. I have to make a buffer of a half a billion tuples and shove it from, from one operator to the next. As so you have these really large intermediate results, which may not be good for cache locality, may put, you know, put, put a lot of memory pressure on, 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 on the system and your caches. So that, again, this is why I think this is a bad idea, and no system, with the exception from MoonDB, uh, really does this. All right, so the last model is, again, what the VectorWise came up with. And again, it sort of seems obvious now, uh, but you know, at the time, this was, this, was, this was novel, this was new. So it's going to look a lot like the, the, the iterator model, where we're going to have a next function that the, the parent calls on the child. But instead of getting back one tuple, you're actually going to get back a, a batch of tuples, or a vector of tuples. Now, the size of this vector can depend on what the hardware actually looks like. Um, we'll talk about this later on with vectorized execution, but like, you know, it's 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 some subset of of the data, some set of, of the total data that an operator is going to generate, and we do I mean, it's size enough that it'll fit in CPU caches, and so the sending the data from one <laughs> operator to the next is a really cheap operation, right? So what this is going to allow to do now in our internal op in our in internal loop inside of our operator, before I was showing you these functions where it was like, get for one tuple do something. When we start talking about vectorized execution, now if we're iterating over a batch of tuples, now we can use SIMD, basically vectorized instructions, to take a bunch of data, feed that into the CPU for one instruction, and then that produces a bunch of answers in parallel all at once with one instruction or a small number of cycles. Right, again, this will make more sense when we talk about the vectorized execution stuff with SIMD, but that's, if, you, if you do this, then it makes a, you can do the, the vectorized execution stuff later, or the vectorized operator execution later. So going back to our example, right? so now inside of our little, little code snippets for operators, we generate the output buffer like the materialized model. Um, I guess, yeah, this should be next, sorry. Not, not output, but it doesn't matter. Right? But now what we're doing is um, we're iterating over uh, our, our data from our children, and they're going to generate a, uh, a buffer. And when the buffer reaches a certain size, we emit it as output. So again, same thing, going top down, we just keep calling output or next, and these guys keep shoving data data up, right? So, like, to think about this. Like, so here, uh, this probe on a single tuple. This could be a vector of tuples to do the probe in parallel inside of our hash table, right? Using so we're getting sort of the we're getting sort of the, the integral parallelism across different uh, operator instances running at the same time. But then each single operator instance, we can then run instructions in parallel using SIMD. Um, which will be a big, big win. So, in my opinion, this is the way to build a modern uh, OLAP system today. And there's a, the, a bunch of the newer systems now all support this. So, like, so like DB2, Oracle, and, and SQL Server, like the, the, the base system like, is a row store that doesn't do this. But if you buy their, like, their query accelerators or their comm store engines, they will, they will do what I'm describing here. So that's why I'm, I'm including them there. But vector-wise is, again, what, what the MoDB X100 thing that you guys read, um, or now Vector or Avalanche, right, this is where this all came out of. And Snowflake was founded by an X vector-wise developer. Right? So that's a lot of the ideas that came out of vector-wise, they, they, they put into Snowflake. All right. So I've already sort of alluded to this, uh, but just to say it, say it concretely, Again, in all my examples, I was showing you what, what's called a top-to-bottom or top-down approach for query processing, where we have a query plan, and the first thing we do is we go grab the root of, of, the, of the query plan tree, and we, call, we fire that function or fire that snippet, and it calls next on its children. So, it's, so the execution permeates from the top, goes down, and then essentially pulls data up to, to the operators as needed. But I, already did, I did talk about the bottom-to-up or the, the, the bottom-up approach, uh, in the materialized model, this is where we start at the bottom of basically our scan operators on our tables or indexes, it doesn't matter, and they start iterating over their, uh, you know, their, their data source, and then they shove data up into their, their parents, right? Again, at a high level, it sort of seems like it's, it's the same thing, and semantically, yes, like, like it actually is a query. Like, it doesn't matter whether it comes from the top down or the bottom up. But the, the bottom up approach turns out to be better 
because you're going to have tighter control of your caches and registers in your pipelines. So you're going to have tighter control of how you move data up into the, into the tree. And then now you, for your pipelines, now you can do things like, well, I, I can keep this CPU or keep this tuple with its values in not just cache, but CPU registers and pass that along from one upper to the next. And that, because CPU registers are the fastest memory you can have, right? Faster than, than L1, L2, L3. If I keep things in my registers, then I, I can have, and I have full control over that, then I can get even better performance. So this idea of pushing from, from the, the bottom up and doing code gen, a lot of these ideas came in hyper. You will read the paper that describes how to do this. Um, and this is actually what we did in our own system in the old version of Peloton and what we're planning, what we're doing now in the new, new system today. So for OLAP, I think the vectorized approach plus bottom up is, is the right way to go. And you'll see this out of the, the, the hyper paper. Yes? So why can't you pass data up like that in approach one? This question is why can't you pass data like efficiently through registers in because if you're calling functions, then every function call resets the stack, right? sets the new stack up, and you're not going to guarantee your things are being in your registers. This is like, I'm basically unrolling the operators, like those snippets. I'm thinking like unrolling the loops and like, and like executing as many things as I can within one, one pass of the loop. Yeah, but can't you have some sort of protocol between your functions and like, okay, I'm calling you and um, put this in the register what you return? And it can be some sort of call, call register. So his, his statement is, uh, couldn't you set up the code such as you have basically some kind of stub or something that says, I'm calling this function and tell that function to make sure it puts something in a CPU regi in a register. Uh, I actually don't know what happens when you do a jump, where you, 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 whether you guarantee that. Like if you're jumping to, to, to another function, I don't know if you can guarantee that. We, let's take this offline. I, I, I don't know the answer. Um, I know why you can do it in this. This one makes sense. It's just, again, it's just unrolling. The function call thing, I think, screws things up. I, but I, I don't have a good answer. We can talk, about, talk to Rashawn about this because he's actually looking at this now. Okay. okay. All right. So again, the processing model is how we're actually, we have a query plan, how we want to, uh, how we're, how we're going to have the different operators get data from their children, uh, and then you know the 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 bottom up versus top top down tells you like where the data flow goes, and then the processing model tells you like what what how much data each operator is is generating, a single tuple like the volcano model, uh, the entire thing like the materialization model, or some subset in between like the vectorized model. So now let's talk about how we actually want to execute qu queries in parallel. So again, we're not talking about within the snippet itself for an operator how we execute that in parallel. It's just now how we organize uh, different operator instances in parallel running in our system. And again, because Intel is going to give us more, more cores, they're not going to give us you know, faster clock speeds. So there's two, a couple different types of parallelism. So there's interquery parallelism and interquery parallelism. We've already sort of talked about in, interquery parallelism. It's basically we're going to have multiple queries running at the same time. And we talked about how the, uh, the, the, the system can schedule this, you know, using a task queue and then having the, the different cores pull, you know, take things out of task queue and, and, and run them. So again, this is basically, again, one query, or multiple queries from different transactions are running at the same time, and we have to sort of load balance them. And for, if we're doing updates, then we already know how to do concurrent control. If they're updating indexes, we already know how to protect, you know, make, make sure it's thread safe. Right, so we already know how to handle this. Uh, in both the cases when they're read-only or when they're updating the database. So there's not much more else we can say about this. The one thing I'll also say too is, to, to the best of my knowledge, no matter what uh, uh, processing model you're using, like whether it's materialization or the, the, uh, the, the materialization iterator or, the, or the, the, the vectorized approach, or how you organize your workers, whether it's a single worker per process or multi-threaded, right? As far as I can tell, no one concurrent scheme is actually easier or harder to implement based on these decisions. They're all, it's all sort of uh, the same. The one that's probably more interesting to us, though, is intra-query parallelism. Again, how do we take a single query and have multiple operator instances running in parallel? So we can do this either horizontally or vertically. So intra-operator parallelism or inter-operator parallelism. So within a single query, how can we execute multiple operators for that query in parallel? So I would say that, again, what I'm describing for both horizontal and vertical, 
these aren't like either or. Like you, if you say I'm going to go horizontal parallelism, doesn't mean you can't do this one. You can actually can do both of them. There's no reason you can't, right? Um, and for every single operator you can have in, in a relational database, um, all of these can be implemented in, in, in either way. Some of them obviously have more benefits. Like that's the, sort of the pipeline breaker stuff. If I, if I can't get, if my operator can't, can't proceed until it gets the full output of its children, then the vertical parallelism actually doesn't help you that much. But every, everyone, for the most part, can execute this one. So the first one, horizontal parallelism. The basic idea here is that, uh, again, we're going to break up a single operator in a query plan or, or, or sort of replicate it into to multiple instances. And each of these instances are going to operate on a different subset of our target data. The target data could be either you know, from, from a table or it could be from the output of another operator. right? Um, and another way to think about this is we talked about morsels last time. Like you can have each operator instance could be operating on a different morsel from, from the table. So the way we're going to organize the system is through this new sort of synthetic or virtual operator in a query plan called the exchange operator. And this comes from the Volcano paper. The, this a notion of an exchange operator for parallel execution is what is defined you know, in the Volcano approach, and that's why they call it that, the, the Volcano processing model. And the basic idea is this is going to act as a barrier that's going to prevent other operators above us in the query plan from starting to execute until we get all the responses from our children. Again, this is another example of, of a pipeline breaker, right? It's just, again, it's just a way to have everything be, you know, I know I need to get all the output of everybody and have it be, um, and wait till that they're all finished. Now, that's not to say that they're all going to be stored in the same location inside the exchange operator. It's just sort of bookkeeping to know that everyone has, has generated all the data they're going to generate. And then once this thing is, gets everything it needs, then you sort of fire things up uh, above you in the query plan. So let's see a real simple query. Same query we had before. We're doing a join A and B. Or now actually we have a predicate on A and a predicate on, on B. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is for our query plan here, we're doing a scan on A. So let's say we break A up into three different morsels. So we have three different threads, whether, you know, whether they're on the same socket or, or different threads or different cores, it doesn't matter. These three threads are going to operate on these, these three different morsels. And then now we actually see, uh, we can actually incorporate some more parts of the query plan into our task because we want to get better pipelining effect. So rather than having, you know, scan on A and then feed that output and then to an, another task or another operator that does the actual filter, we'll just say that this thread uh, within a single pipeline, we'll, we'll get, grab a tuple from A and then actually run through the filter process. And actually, we can actually also include the, uh, the, the, the projection up here because if we know, you know if, if A is a really wide table, has a lot of tuples, and we're not a column store, we don't, we don't want to be passing up the entire tuple from, from one operator to the next. So maybe we'll push down the filter, the, the projection as well. All right, so now again, this is now represents a single task in our pipeline. Scan on A filter it, and then do the projection just to have just the data we need to actually do the join. Then, this, then they're going to build our hash table because we're doing a join. And again, there's, there's no relational operator to build a hash table. It's just a, a join operator. But again, they're all going to do this. But then now, they're going to feed this into the exchange operator. And again, think about this. The, we're going down the left side of the tree here. We can't actually start computing the join until we have our entire hash table because otherwise we would have false negatives, because something that maybe should have matched does a lookup in the hash table and doesn't see anything because we haven't finished building it here. So the exchange operator, again, is saying that I can't proceed anywhere else up in my query plan. I can't start producing the output of my join until all of these guys have produced their, their, their entire, you know, process all their data that they need. So again, I'm not saying that these things are separate hash tables or that it's all right into a single hash table and then somehow they're, they're passing the hash table on the exchange operator. It's just a you know, bookkeeping thing to know that I have to wait till these guys actually finish. <coughs> right? And then we have now on the right side of the join, again, we break B up into three morsels. They're going to do the filter and then do, do the same projection. But then now they're actually going to probe into the hash table. So these guys won't get fired off until I know I've completed uh, my, and bu built my join here. So again, this is where the internal bookkeeping comes in. These guys are dependent on this one, so these guys can't execute until this guy, the exchange operator, uh, has, has told that everything's done. But then now we can run the join and out parallel. So think of like a bunch of other threads now. Once these guys finish, actually no, in this case here, the reason why it's not an exchange operator, because this is actually a single pipeline here. So from one thread, it's going to do the scan on B, the filter, the projection, 
then probe the hash table to see whether you have a join. And then if there's an output, it produces that output in some output buffer here. But now I'm going to have these three threads running in parallel. And these output buffers then need to be coalesced by this exchange operator up here. So I'm not showing this too well. Like the, the, these threads basically stop here. Then new threads, or the same threads can start running these tasks, and they'll stop up here at the exchange operator here. And then once the exchange operator gets all the results from uh, my different threads, right, then it can produce the, produce the output to, to the rest of the part of the query, or to, to actually to the client here. So is this clear? So this, this exchange operator is, um, in different code bases, it won't be called exchange. Right, but the 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 the, the, ac on the academic side, this this basic idea of coalescing things and blocking other threads from pre in proceeding in the query plan until you get all your results is called an exchange. All right, the other the last the other type of parallelism is interoperator parallelism. So this is where again we we we're going to have in a single query plan we could still be executing different operator instances in parallel. But we're also now going to be executing different parts of the query plan in parallel on, on different threads. Right? And the idea here is that uh, you're going to have one thread sort of spinning that, that for loop from, from the, the snippet I showed in the operator. It's just waiting for, for the output of, of, a, of a child. When that child emits it, it sort of hands it off to the queue from, from its parent. And then it can go back and start maybe processing more data in its for loop while the other thread can then uh, process the thing it was given and, and, and continue with that, right? It'll make more sense when I show it at a high level. So I would say that this approach is not widely used, as far as I know, in, uh, in traditional relational database systems. Where you see this is in the stream processing systems like Spark, uh, Kafka, Flink, and a bunch of other ones, right? Because in these worlds, you have these like source and sync concepts where you have these like sync operators are generating data that can then be, sorry, the source operators generate data that then pass to syncs who then process them and pass them on to other, other operators. And each of those guys could be running on the same machine or different thread or to other machines, but you can sort of farm out and scale horizontally uh, that way. But within the query plan, you're scaling vertically, or at least your parallelism. Right, so same query plan we had before, but now we say for this join operator here, right, this, say we're doing a really simple nested loop join, Right, for every single tuple on, on the outer side and every single tuple on the inner side, admit, admit the output based on the join. Right? So I could just be spinning this thing, you know, every single time I get a tuple from the, from the right side, every single time I get a tuple on the left side, then do my join. And then it produces an output that then sends up to another thread that's just spinning, waiting for output to come out of this guy, and then actually do the, the final projection and then produce more output. Right? So again, like, it's not going to be spinning all the time. This, this will be a blocking call. But think of like I have one, one worker thread dedicated to, to running this snippet, and another worker thread is dedicated to running this thing. Right? And again, I can scale these out parallel, uh, horizontally, for, uh, have multiple instances of these operators running different threads, right? So that like I'm doing this join as, with as many threads as possible. But the idea here is that I every time I emit here. This is a non-blocking call. This guy goes back and goes gets, goes gets to the next tuple, and because some other some other worker is going to crunch on this, right? And again, it stalls. I guess it's a stalling call, so you're not like you know burning the CPU while you're doing this. All right. So some finish up, some last things. So the um, coming up with the right number of workers we actually want to have in a query plan is a hard problem. This is sort of the scheduling stuff that we talked about before, right? We had this you know notion of uh, these different thread pools, the thread pools can steal data from, or tasks from other thread pools. How you organize that is highly dependent on the organization or implementation of the database system. Um, and this is usually something that's like, you base it on the number of cores of the CPU that I have minus some number for, uh, you know, for, for back, background tasks or maintenance tasks. This is something that you usually tune, the default usually is like, I have this many threads and I want to use this many workers for it. How you're actually going to allocate the, the workers uh, is sort of the, the schedule stuff we talked about before. So easiest approach is that you have one worker dedicated to a, a single core. Um, and this is where you use task set or uh, set, schedule, set affinity to make sure that nobody else runs on your same core. So you always have, you know, there's never a context switch at your, at your core. You're just sort of spinning through and doing as work as fast as possible. The alternative is that you have multiple workers per core. And this looks into the pool stuff we talked about before. And 
the idea here is that if you have one thread get blocked because it because it has to go acquire some resource, whether it's disk or memory or 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 CPU or sorry or or disk memory or network, then other threads can can start processing work and, and make, still make forward progress. So there's no one approach that's better than another. For OTP, at least in in HStore and VoltDB, this is what they used. This is what Hyper uses as well. But you know, a bunch of other systems do this. I, I don't have a strong opinion that one is better than another. How we're actually going to assign tasks for our uh, workers is that, again, either push or pull. And this is the stuff we read about uh, last class for scheduling. Do I have my threads basically say go to a single queue and pull data out or pull task out and execute them? Or do I have a centralized coordinator pushing work to them? Again, no one approach is better than another. Um, I don't have a strong opinion about this. Right. You could just say do what Hyper does, when, and, they're, and they're doing a pool. But I, <laughs> I, I don't know whether that's better. All right, so finish up. Um, the main takeaway here, and, and will be a reoccurring theme throughout the rest of the semester, is that oftentimes the way we as humans organize our code and our system is actually going to be the worst one, way to do this for performance. Um, the... And in, in, in order to overcome this, we have to be aware of what our CPU actually looks like. Right? What, like, you know, what are the pipelines? How much cash do we have? How the, the, the different sockets are set up? Uh, and that's not always going to be easy, but again, they pay us a lot of money to build these database systems, so that's fine. And then, in my opinion, the one thing I, I only do, the one thing I do have a strong opinion about, but it's not like a controversial opinion, because it's, the, the science clearly that, shows that this is the case, the vectorized bottom-up execution approach is the right way to do OLAP execution. And for OTP queries, it's actually not that not bad, bad approach either, because the query plans are usually quite short. They're not like super big. Um, so this is what we did in Peloton, and this is what we're doing now in, in our new system. Okay? So any questions about this? All right, so next class. Next class, the paper I'm having you read is actually, I think it's actually one of the, the, the most important papers in, uh, in like, it's in the database research community that came out the last, one of the most important ones that came out in the last two years, right? Uh, it's, yeah, I don't want to spoil it for you, but basically, like, it's actually now in production in SQL Server 2019. Like, it was so good. Like, the, the turnaround time from Microsoft was like, oh, shit, you guys wrote this paper, to actually putting it in the full system was, like, a year. It was that good. Um, and nobody else does this. And I'm sure there's patents all over it, and no, one's else, no one else is going to do it for a while. Um, but the, 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 the high level of thing we're going to talk about next class is pushing more complex logic that the application wants to do to now run that inside the database system itself. So user defined functions, store procedures, um, are ways to do things that you can't really express in SQL, but do it in a functional form uh, and have the database system execute that efficiently. And what you're going to see is that what the Freud paper does is like it says, you don't even need a procedural language. Or for, for a large percentage of the user-defined functions that people write, you actually can convert it to relational algebra, inline it in the query plan, throw that to the optimizer, and don't even bother with like function calls and shit like that. It's, it's awesome. Um, yeah, so, I mean, so I highly re recommend reading this thoroughly. Um, but we'll, we'll cover it in details uh, on Monday next week. All right, any questions about this? All right, guys, have a good weekend. Make your dig you know, it, honey. You got a bounce to get the 40 ounce bottle. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't it no puzzle, I guzzle, cause I'm more a man. I'm down in the 40, and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see saying eyes on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw my three in the freezer so I can chill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, oops, don't spill it. Cause ain't eyes is said, the pain eyes red. You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head. Take back the pack of duds. You go get you some same knives and drink it to the studs. Billy D is the silly cheese, sit down with the weak guys. Be a man and get a can of snake eyes.